Well, today we're starting a brand new series called A Rebel's Guide to Joy. And uh, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. We're gonna be studying through the New Testament book of Philippians together for the next 10 weeks. Honestly, this is one of my favorite books in the Bible and it's gonna be such a rich study. And I'm really honored to introduce to you our guest speaker to kick things off today, Jody Hickerson. Uh, Jody serves as the teaching pastor and programming director for Mission Church in Ventura, California. It's a church that she and her husband, Mike, helped start back in 2011, and it's a church that we've been partnered with for a number of years. Uh, she and her husband, Mike, have uh, three beautiful daughters, and uh, honestly, um, they have been just dear friends of mine personally uh, for a long time, and Jody has become such a dear friend of Traders Point. She's been here in the past to teach before and always does such an incredible job. Uh, she was here on Friday night to teach for Women's Night and just brought the house down. Uh, fun little fact, uh, those of you that might remember when a guy named Mike Bro has been here to teach, uh, Jody is Mike's daughter. So would you please, across all of our locations, give a warm Trader's Point welcome to Jody as she comes and teaches. How's everybody doing this morning? Good? You all good this morning? Good. Um, like Aaron said, my name is Jody Hickerson. I want to welcome all of our Traders Point campuses. It is just so good um, to be together today. I have had the opportunity of being here um, a few times in the past, and I got to be a part of the incredible Women's Night Friday night. I mean, unbelievable, so amazing. Um, Aaron and Lindsay are friends to me and, and to my husband. And listen, we just love all that God is doing in and through Traders Point. I just want to say, just because I, I've gotten to be part of starting a church plant 12 years ago and getting like, to be on the receiving end of churches like you all, this community, that are open-handed and kingdom-minded and generous, I'm just telling you, it is a big kingdom deal. That there are people that you may never meet this side of eternity that I have the privilege of knowing and watching their lives change. I mean, last year alone at Mission, we baptized 300 people. And you're a part of that story. Like your kingdom investment, the way that you give around here, like it really matters in your support um, of church plants and so many church plants all over the country and the world. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we are kicking off a series today on the book of Philippians called The Rebel's Guide to Joy. Don't you like kind of be called a rebel? Um, it's kind of cool. Um, you should have received one of these um, Rebel's Guide to Joy workbooks or guidebooks um, on your way in. If you didn't get one of these, make sure that you get one on on the way out. They're free. Pick one up. This is just a great tool for all of us as we go through this book and we go through this series over the next 10 weeks to track along um, and, to, and to just deepen our faith and relationship with Jesus. Um, this guidebook also parallels with the daily reading email. So that's getting delivered to our inboxes like Monday through Friday. And if you haven't subscribed to that, like make sure that you do that just so you can track along and, and keep applying what we're learning on the weekends into our everyday lives. Um, there's a place in this guidebook to take notes. Um, um, every Sunday so that you can bring this back with you every single week. The whole point is jump in. Like jump into this book, jump into the guidebook, jump into the daily reading, jump into this series. I mean, the book of Philippians is four chapters long. Um, it takes about 15 minutes to read. So you could read it every day if you want. But jump in because I really believe that if we do, with the opportunities we have to get plugged in and, and really learn about this series, we're going to become the kind of rebels that are deep in a shallow world and constant in a changing world and compassionate in a cynical world and unified in a divisive world and humble in a competitive world and confident in a fearful world and patient in an instant world and content in a material world and joyful in an angry world. Don't you want to be that kind of rebel, the kind of rebel that our world needs? Well, the passage that the team and Aaron gave me for this weekend to kick off this series is from Philippians chapter 1, um, verses 3 through 11, with the title of, When Loneliness Sets In. 
So just to give a little bit of a context before we jump into that, of this whole series, the book of Philippians um, in the New Testament of our Bibles is actually a letter. Um, It's one of the many letters that we have in the New Testament written by a guy named Paul. Paul is like the OG church planner. And so we have all these letters that like he wrote back to churches that he had been a part of or churches that he had helped start. And then when he would move on, he would write them letters and they're included in our New Testament, which is just so amazing. So this letter is the letter that he wrote to the people of the church in in Philippi. And this particular letter, like some of his other ones, Paul is writing from prison. Or, or some believe he's under house arrest, but either way, he's like locked up. Like Paul's locked up because he, Paul was forever getting in trouble for talking about Jesus, but it never shut him up. So he's locked up, he's in prison, and this church in Philippi thought of him. And they send him like a care package. Like they send a dude with some supplies to visit him and bring him some some supplies. And and you know that had to just mean so much. You know, you're in prison, you're alone. And this church remembers you and they send you something. And so Paul is moved by this. And he sends them back this letter. Um, We're going to be studying over the next 10 weeks. Let me just read the first or these eight verses um, today as we kick off. This is how he starts this letter to these people. He says, man, I thank God. Every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. I pray that your love will overflow more and more, and that you'll keep on growing in knowledge and understanding, for I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. When I read this passage again, and, and I knew the title for this weekend was When Loneliness Sets In. My first thought was like, yeah, like I hear it. Dude's in prison, like alone, and he's unfairly there, and he just got this care package, and he clearly loves and misses these people, and he doesn't want to be where he's at, so like I get it. He's lonely, but I also thought about these verses and how they're just like his greeting to this letter. It's like before you even jump into the real letter, it's like how he's greeting the people. So I was like, how does this apply to us? Like, like not many of us are sitting in jail right now. But the more that I thought about this passage, the more I thought about my own life, the more that I prayed for you, I started realizing, man, many of us, many of us are living in our own prisons of isolation and loneliness, and it is affecting us. And it is stealing our joy. And we can learn some things right here, right here in the beginning of this letter from Paul about how we relate to one another and what that means. Because here's the truth. We need each other. It is all over scripture. From the very first page until the last, we need each other. Then you look at the life of Jesus. I mean, if you read the biographies of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you start reading about his life, about his followers, even what happened after he left and the church began, what you're going to see is a together kind of thing. They lived together. They ate together. They walked together. They sang together. They camped together. They traveled together. They laughed together. They cried together. What Jesus set up for us was a together kind of thing, and that's because he knows us, and he knows that we need each other other. It's the way God designed our lives to work. Your brain, your heart, your soul all respond to relationships with other people. And listen, there's tons of scientific and psychiatric and psychological research that actually backs up what God says, that we need each other, that that it's such a good practice to be in community with one another. Actually, the value of human connectedness is one of the most proven by research. We know more about the value of connection and the destructiveness of isolation than like anything else. Tons of research shows that when people have strong support systems where they're processing their needs and their feelings and their fears and their problems and their joys, they're physically healthier, 
they're emotionally healthier, they're more likely to reach their attempts to change their lives or reach their goals, I mean, on and on. In fact, the research also shows that those who have bad health habits, like smoking or elevated blood pressure or, or physical inactivity, but they have strong connectedness, they actually live longer than people who have great health habits but are disconnected or isolated which makes me believe better a Krispy Kreme with friends than salad alone, okay? I mean, that's, it's the research. I'm just, I'm just telling you it's in the research. I'm just kidding, um, a kind of, kind of kidding. Because everything we do, every part of us is affected by the quality and the amount and the level of connection we have in our lives. And man, over the past few years especially, I have seen and I have witnessed and I, I have experienced how loneliness takes a toll on us, how isolation can take us out, how distance from one another can make us drift. You know, pre-COVID or uh, pre-pandemic, however you want to put it, three out of five people said that they were experiencing loneliness. You think maybe that number has gone up? I mean, we saw in real time what isolation did to our mental health our souls and spirits, our friendships, our kids. And it was prolonged, and we stopped some of our gatherings. We didn't go to our meetings. We all created some new habits. Some relationships just ended. Some of our people moved away, mostly to Texas. I don't know. Um, some of what we had is still not the same, is it? I would guess that most all of us have experienced loneliness on a different level in the last few years than ever before. And man, if we zoom out and we look at the fallout, a mental health crisis in our nation, suicide rates, divorce rates, addiction rates spiking, national church attendance declining, cancel culture increasing, division, racism, separation, we've got to ask the question, what is broken? And please hear me, I am... I'm not blaming the pandemic on this, but we would be ignorant not to recognize that the pandemic revealed and exposed and poured gasoline on an already existing and growing pandemic of loneliness and isolation in our world, in our communities and in our own lives. What is broken is our connection to one another. We have never been more isolated and separated from each other in history and that's our problem. And I think there are a few things fighting against us that makes this really hard in our lives today. Things that we're going to have to rebel against if we're going to find and experience the real joy and connection that God has for us. And the first thing is culture. And I'm not like one to like rail against the culture. You know, we live in it. It's our time. There's good things about it. God placed us here. But we do have to understand that the way culture has changed over the last 50 years, even 20 years, has made it even more difficult to be in community and really be known by one another. I mean, I don't really feel old, but you know, I'll age myself right here because I do remember the world before the internet. And the world before the internet, kids, you like only had the capacity to know 100 to 150 people. Like what was their joys, their births, their milestones, their tragedies, what's going on in their life. It was like 100 to 150 max because they lived in your neighborhood or you went to school with them or church with them or you were related to them. Like that's, that's the circle. Now we know the joys and the births and the milestones and the tragedies of the entire world. And I'm not saying that that's all bad. I'm not at all suggesting we put our heads in the sand on what's going on in the world. I'm just saying something shifted. Because our minds and our souls and our hearts don't have the capacity to carry all that, we've shifted and decided just to turn inward, and now we don't even get to know the people we do have the capacity to know. We've turned inward. I heard someone describe it this way, so I'll ask you. When was the last time you went down the street and asked your neighbor to borrow an egg? Like, I don't know, most of my childhood was spent going down the street and asking for an egg. And I don't know why it was always an egg. Like, why was it always an egg? Now, full disclosure, I still do this. Well, I don't do it. I send one of my girls um, over to our neighbors, Andy and Betty, and like, hey, can you run over and see if Andy and Betty have, that, Betty have an egg or, or a cup of sugar or whatever? But my girls look at me like, you are so weird. Like why don't we have our own eggs? And we have Amazon and DoorDash and I'll just drive and get it. Like, I don't wanna go ask them for an egg. That's so weird, mom, you're so weird. 
because we've turned inward and more and more towards just our nuclear families in the last couple of decades than ever before. I mean, you think back further in culture, community was a necessity for survival, like for life. Like we're not hunting together or, or gathering together or cooking together anymore. Like the culture that we live in is way more independent and we're just expected to figure it out ourselves and on our own. And if we can't, well, that's on us. You don't got an egg, that's your problem, right? But it hasn't always been that way. And we've got to like notice that shift so that we can fight against it. We, we got to rebel a little bit here and be different to not turn inward and just look at our screens, but to look up and to look out and to show up to that thing and, and to make the like awkward invite or knock on somebody's door. Everything in our culture today is fighting against this and we need to rebel a little bit and show up. Then there's our own pain and shame fighting against this idea of really being known and being in community with one another. And that's because people can be morons, right? That's the truth. I mean, most of our best moments, highest moments, greatest joys come from relationship with people. And most of our deepest hurt and heartache and worry and concern come from our relationships with people. And for some of us, man, we just don't want to try again because of the pain. I mean, we've tried and we've been rejected. We've trusted before and we've been betrayed or we don't get invited. Or people have said things and it's hurt us and it just feels like, why in the world would I open myself up to that again? Or it's our shame that keeps us from one another because we feel ashamed about ourselves. Like, I just, I can't let anybody know who I am. I don't want to talk about it. I, I, I don't want people to know where I'm at in my life or what's going on with our kids or our past or, or the decisions that we're, we're making. I would rather just live with it than let anybody know it. And in our shame, we think, I can never tell anybody this, and I might as well just never show my face around there again. And we start in our isolation to think that we're the only ones that feel this way, when the truth is all of us got stuff we don't want to say out loud. This is why we need each other. Another real thing fighting against this whole idea of being in relationship with one another is our enemy. Y'all know we got an enemy? an enemy of our souls, and he is a thief, and he is a liar. And scripture tells us that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Like that's his end game for us. That's his end game for you, that's his end game for me to steal our peace and steal our joy and kill our confidence and kill our purpose and destroy our families and destroy our futures. And one of his greatest strategies is isolation because he knows we are so much easier to pick off when we are isolated, when we are alone. And so he will use whatever it takes to get us isolated and alone. He'll use our culture. He'll use our pain and shame against us. He'll feed us lies about ourselves and others. He'll stir up our, our offenses. And I'm not, I'm not blaming the devil for our own bitterness and unforgiveness and distance and loneliness. I'm just saying he's got some tools to work with. And he will use, he will double down on this one in order to take us out. And we need to be aware of his strategy. We got to push against it. We got to rebel because when we do, when we rebel against a culture that says, hey, turn inward. When we, when we show up anyway with our pain and shame, when we risk again to be in community, when we refuse to let the enemy take ground and get us isolated, guess what happens? We get to experience Life and love and friendship and partnership and forgiveness and support and comfort and growth and joy that I'm telling you is not possible to experience alone. We need people. And I'll just let you know right now, because we don't know one another. I'm preaching to myself. This has been the number one thing that God has been bringing to my own attention this year for my own life. So. Like, this is an all skate if you live through the 80s and 90s. Like, this is all of us. So let's just, let's just rebel together. Let's do this together. As awkward as it might be, as countercultural, as risky as it may feel, it's the rebel's guide to joy. So I want to go back and I want to look through Paul's greeting, right? This is something that we could have just skipped over, just like, oh, yeah, there's this greeting. But man, it is filled with truth on how we could be in this deep kind of relationship that he had with these people with one another. First off the top, thank God for one another. 
Paul writes, I I think, my God, every time I remember you. You know what I love about this? That he tells them. I'm guessing that you've got someone or some relationship in your life that you thank God for. Tell them. Like, we don't do this enough. We assume that they just, like, know. But the truth is, unexpressed gratitude feels like ingratitude to those that we're actually grateful for. People don't always know how we feel. Your spouse, your parents, your friends, your kids, like they can't read your mind, so tell them. Like seriously, whoever is coming to your mind right now that you thank God for, that you're grateful for, send them a text today. Leave a voice text today. Go old school and write them a card or get on Marco Polo or, or DM them or shock the whole world and give them a call, you know, just to say, I thank God for you. We got to be the people that express this, that send the text, that do the thing, whatever it is, because listen, our relationships with one another get deeper and our joy gets bigger when we express our gratitude for one another. Then pray for one another. Paul says, in all my prayers for all of you. Like he, he is praying for all of them. And let's not underestimate the power in praying for one another. Paul didn't just have them on his mind and on his heart. He didn't just miss them. He had them in his prayers. He was bringing them before the Father, the God of heaven and earth, on behalf of what was going on in their lives. And it is no small thing to pray for one another. There is power in praying for one another. I've always admired uh, my mom. She has on the inside of like her journal just a list of names, and it is a growing list of names. It's gone to the margins. It's on the back of pages. Just names of people that she is praying for by name. This matters. Are you praying for anybody? You got any names? Do you have anybody praying for you? Man, it matters. And if your answer is no, I mean, there's no, there's no shame here. There's no failure. That's an opportunity. That's an opportunity to take a risk, to be a little rebellious and ask somebody, hey, would you care praying for me, for my marriage, for my work, for this transition? Ask somebody to pray for you. It's an opportunity to make your own list and start praying by name for people in your life. Then it says partner with one another. Paul says, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Like Paul had a relationship with these people. You know, it was a friendship, but there was also this partnership. Like there was this other level of connection, which was being on mission together. Like they had this partnership in the gospel. And listen, I know this isn't the case for like every single one of our relationships, but there is something so sweet about having some people in our lives that we are on mission with. I got to see this firsthand in this place Friday night, right, where there was a team of over 200 volunteers that came together to partner with one another for the sake of the gospel to create an incredible experience and environment for thousands of women to connect with Jesus. That's partnership. They were on mission together. There was teamwork and synergy, and it is a beautiful thing. And it's something that happens around here in all of our campuses all the time, right? Care team members that are meeting people's needs, walking beside each other, marriage mentors that are coming alongside couples, kids and student volunteers investing in the next generation, parking lot teams and greeters and coffee makers. I mean, thank God for the coffee makers, right? So that this place could be welcoming and we could all be awake and there's admins and there's band members and there's production team. Like this is how God set it up, his church, that we would all have a part to play, that we would be partnered with one another in the gospel. And yes, it is about serving and contributing and living beyond yourselves, which is awesome. But another reason he set it up this way is because of the relationships we gain when we get on mission together. It's a beautiful thing. We start partnering with one another. So maybe your big rebellious act is to get on a team around here, get involved in the ministry around here. Listen, we need each other. This, this place, this team, this partnership needs you and you need it. It's a beautiful thing to partner with one another. Next, encourage one another. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you 
will carry it out onto completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Man, isn't that cool? This has personally been one of my favorite verses to turn to, like uh, for encouragement. Um, but I, I've always viewed it just like as a personal promise. But I really love reading this in this relational context that it's written. Because what an amazing way to encourage one another, to show up for one another and remind one another, oh, hey, God's not done with you yet. God's not done working yet. He, he, what he started in you, he's not going to bail on. Sometimes we just are discouraged and sometimes we wanna just give up and sometimes we feel like, man, we're three steps forward and two steps back. But if we show up for one another and we say, hang on, God's not, work, God, God's not done working. He's gonna work in you through every circumstance and every challenge and he's gonna carry you and he's gonna keep working this thing out until it's complete, until it's completion. Not, it's gonna be long after you're gone. He's gonna keep working in and through your life till the day of Christ Jesus. Keep going. And we look at one another and we go, hey, it's progress. It's not perfection. God's still doing his thing. You may feel three steps forward, two steps back, but hey, you know what? You're still one step forward. So you take the next step. And we encourage one another to go, God's got this thing. Being confident in this, God's not going to stop working. And your life, keep going. That's encouraging to one another. Verses 7 and 8 highlight these three beautiful concepts, grace, love, and compassion for one another. All of you sharing God's grace with me, God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. And I, I love just how real and personal and vulnerable that sounds from Paul and how vulnerable that is. And listen, when we are real and personal and vulnerable with one another, and we really do share grace and love and the tender compassion of Christ Jesus for one another, that's where it really gets good. But it's not easy. It's going to take us rebelling against everything in us that wants to hide and wants to cover up and wants to just keep things on the surface because we're living in the highlight real culture. And we've got our own pain and shame around this and our enemies feeding us lies and we think, man, I, I, can't, I, I can't be real. I mean, if people really knew what I struggle with, if people really knew what was going on with our kids, if, if they knew how much I was really drinking at home, if people knew the doubts that I have, man, they wouldn't want me, like me, accept me, and I've been there. I'm telling you, the image management thing, that keeps us from getting help. That keeps us from getting well. That keeps us from friendship. That keeps us from healing. We need some people that know our stuff. We need to be known by some someones. Ones we can turn to when life is a mess or when we are a mess. Ones that we don't have to do image management with because they can see us for who we are and we're not afraid of that. I've always loved this line from the movie Almost Famous that says the only true currency in this bankrupt world is what you share with someone else when you're uncool. Like when you're just like, this is me. And we need safe places for vulnerability, safe places to be real safe places to be heard, safe places to shed fear and shame, safe places to confess. And we need some people in our life that we can count on that are gonna respond to us with grace, with love, and with the tender compassion of Jesus Christ. And let me say this also, we need to be those people. We need to be those people that respond with grace and love and tender compassion. James, the brother of Jesus, tells us that this kind of living will be part of our healing. He tells us in James 5, 16, confess your sins to each other. It's pretty vulnerable. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. You may be healed. I can't even explain to you how powerful this has been in my own life. Because there's something about saying it out loud and having some people that are willing to be in it with you and not judge you but respond with love and grace and compassion. I mean, it, it starts to lose its power. And you don't have to confess your sins to everyone. You hear me say that. Just someone or some someones that you know would respond with love, grace, and compassion for you. And if you don't have a safe place like this, maybe create one. I'm telling you, if we become people as a church of Jesus Christ that creates spaces 
where we can shed shame and share struggles and confess our sins and be real with one another and respond with love, grace, and compassion for one another, that's life-changing. Brene Brown puts it this way. She's a shame researcher, and she says shame hates it. When we reach out and tell our story, it hates having words wrapped around it. It can't survive being shared. This is how we fight against what's broken. This is how we rebel against just going with the flow. This is how we get well. This is how we grow. This is how we become the men and women that God created us to be. This is one of the most powerful things that we see in recovery groups like AA and GA and NA and SA because everyone knows you don't walk this road alone. And this is the most, one of the most powerful things that Jesus has given us. It's one another that we don't walk this road alone, that we would have one another. Grace, love, and the tender compassion of Jesus Christ. And then we've got grow with one another. Paul says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding for I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ for this will bring much glory and praise to God. This is such a cool component of life together, that we actually get to help each other grow. Like all of Paul's language here is like that your love would abound more and more, that you'd keep on growing in knowledge and in insight, that we get to be a part of helping one another grow, that we would be people and we would have people in our lives that keep reminding us of what matters most and keep encouraging us to abound in love and to grow in knowledge and in insight. And listen, this, this kind of growing together only happens when we surround ourselves with people who are headed in that direction, headed in the same direction, spurring one another on as we run this race side by side. I mean, Proverbs 13, 20, it warns us, it says, he who walks with the wise will become wise. That's how we grow, but whoever walks with fools will suffer harm. And let me just tell you right now, I have lived both parts of that verse, and they are true. <laughs> and what do you think our enemy wants? Probably the suffer harm part, right? And some of us, if we're honest, we're experiencing that, or we, we have experienced that, or we will, because of who we're walking with. We're not growing with them. Like, we gotta, we gotta think about this. Like, if we wanna develop character, and not just do everything we feel like doing. We gotta stop hanging with people that just do whatever they feel like doing. If we wanna grow in the truth and have it set us free, we gotta stop surrounding ourselves with people who say, oh, just make up your own truth. If we wanna renew our minds to a healthy way of thinking, we can't keep company with people who have destructive ways of thinking. You wanna make great decisions this year, you gotta stop running with people that are making terrible decisions. Like this is just true. Our lives are greatly influenced by who we are walking with, who we invite in at that closest level in our lives is so important. And I'm not talking about like, you know, don't have friends that don't believe like you, not, not that. I'm saying your inner circle, that all of us need some people that will walk with us that are headed in the right direction. Wise people, people that spur us on, that call us out who want the best for us, who know God, who inspire us to know God, who remind us of what really matters, who care more about that character that's being produced than like our fit check. Like they, they really care about who we're becoming and they love us too much to watch us wreck our lives. We need some people like that growing with one another. And let me just say this, if you don't have these people, you're like, where are these wise people? Where, where can I find them? I mean, maybe jump into a group around here. Give it a shot. There won't be perfect people there, but I mean, neither are you, so that's good. But there will be some people there that are going the same direction. There'll be some wise people there. There'll be some people that are trying to pursue God too, growing in knowledge and depth of insight. You need these people, and these people need you. Okay, last thing from these greetings. Um, speak Jesus to one another. Speak Jesus to one another. I'm gonna throw this whole thing back up here uh, or, or just see some of these highlights from that whole passage, those eight verses, some of the highlights. Do you see it over and over? Jesus, 
Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus, Christ Jesus. I mean, Paul's like, as I start this letter, just in my introduction, I can't stop talking about him, and I got to just keep pointing you to him because it's all about him, and it's all for him. And this life we live with one another is all through him, and it's all because of him. And we got to be people that do this for one another, that keep pointing one another to Jesus, that we keep speaking Jesus to one another. My fire pit is my safe place for me, and it has been for decades now. So every week at my fire pit on Thursday nights, I've sat around with women that I love and trust the most, and we do all of these, all of these things together. And it's the most important, one of the most important things in my life. And I'm t I know it's hard to do. Like, we've been doing this for a long time. We've got kids and jobs and all the things. We meet from 9 p.m. to midnight. This is where we could make time for it. And we're getting old, so it's like, you know, it's, it's tiring. But I'm telling you, it is worth it. It is worth it. And listen, we're not licensed therapists and trying to fix each other. We're just women that are, are willing to hold the space and then point each other to Jesus. It reminds me so much of the story. Um, I think it's found in both Mark and Luke where the paralyzed man wants to get to Jesus to be healed. And so his friends carry him on a mat and they get to where Jesus is teaching and they get to that place, but the crowd is so big they can't get through it. So they're like, hey, let's just take him up on the roof and like, you know, lower him through the roof. And they do. They get up on the roof. They wreck the roof, right? They, they get up on the roof and they start tearing open the roof and they lower this man in front of Jesus. I mean, I have lived through some distracting things when I've been preaching and teaching, you know, babies crying and people yelling. One dude listened, watched the NBA finals on the front row, like full volume. I was like, wow, okay. Um, but this was like drywall, you know, coming down as Jesus is talking but they were willing to do whatever it took to get their friend in front of Jesus. And that's how I view these women in my life. I know they're gonna speak Jesus to me. They're gonna point me back to him. They're gonna do whatever it takes to get me back to him and in front of him, no matter what, even if they gotta carry me. So listen, you want the inside scoop as we kick off this series on the Rebel's Guide to Joy? It's that we need each other. Don't do this alone. Thank God for one another. Pray for one another. Partner with one another. Encourage one another. Share grace, love, and compassion with one another. Grow with one another. And speak Jesus to one another. I thought I'd close this out today, if I could, by just um, speaking Jesus over you. So why don't you stand right where you're at? Because this is it. I don't know what you walked in here with today. I don't know what's going on in your life. But I know Jesus. And I know he loves you. And I know he's for you. And with this opportunity I have, I just want to speak Jesus over you. That this Jesus, he's with you. And he's for you. And because of Jesus now, Sin cannot choke us, bury, crush, or beat us. Shame will not conquer, condemn, or defeat us. We are alive because He is alive. And we rise up because He is risen. And we know love because He first loved us. And we win because after three days, He got up. And listen, He still gets up. He stands up to fight for you stoops down in the mire for you, holds out the light for you, breathes in new life for you. From east to west, our sins hurled. The reason for his coming, for God so loved the world. And there is no greater love than this, to give us life. He laid down his. That's a love without partiality, one that throughout legality, despite our morality, still suffered brutality. That's a love that extends to our frailty. When our lives were derailed, he posted the bail. He discarded the scale. He himself took the nails. He will not fail me. That's a love that gives us new graces, new life, new starts, new freedom, new embraces. 
from the one who erases, replaces, and leaves no traces of who we once were before he took our places. It's a love in Jesus in which there is no rejection, no demand for perfection, no judge's objection, but affection, connection, a dead life resurrection. It is a love so deep, so long, so high. It is a love so steep, so strong, so wide. There is no place in us it cannot fill. No wound in us it cannot seal. No pain in us it cannot heal. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.